Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about one of the great 20th century intellectuals, Edward Said, well remembered for his monumental book, Orientalism, and for his passionate defense of the Palestinian cause. He was a literary critic, a pianist, an all-around polymath. The public debates that he was at the center of in his day would help to define the public dialogue today over such issues of race, colonialism, the rights of people everywhere, and much more. My guest for this conversation is Timothy Brennan. He is the author of a new biography called Places of Mind, A Life of Edward Said. He is a professor of the humanities at the University of Minnesota. He is also a former student and friend of Edward Said. He joins us over Zoom. Timothy Brennan, it is my very good pleasure to welcome you to this program. Thank you for having me. It's good to have you. I've been wanting to do a show on Edward Said for some time. Very glad we came into contact with your biography on him. And I, I suspect most people listening to this program recognize the name Edward Said. Uh, many probably are even familiar with some of his work, but probably not everyone. So just briefly here for context at the at, right at the top, what do you think is significant about Edward Said for our world today? Well, if you think of the great public intellectuals that the United States has produced in the post-war, you know, you think of perhaps Noam Chomsky or Susan Sontag or Hannah Arendt, he's the only one who taught literature for a living. So one of the things that makes him unique, more or less, is that he was an English professor who became a media celebrity and someone who was sought out by the State Departments under the Carter and Reagan administrations to act as the unofficial liaison between the PLO and uh, the U.S. administration over um, negotiations surrounding the Palestinian issue. So uh, it's, it's this variety of things that he managed to uh, pull off. Uh, all of them, I think it's fair to say, having to do ultimately with his understanding of literature and the art of literary criticism and the role of a humanities, particularly a humanities-based intellectual, in helping, you know, establish new agendas and think of uh, possible worlds and uh, be the preserver of the historical record. He was somebody who wrote books for both academic and non-academic audiences. He was published into 30 different languages around the world. He was, as I say, active both politically uh, and uh, literarily. He transformed the university in a variety of ways by opening the doors to non-Western literature and to a larger professoriate uh, coming from uh, countries outside the West, from the former colonies of the European empires. So he he really did make his mark in a number of different areas. A, a significant force in post-colonial studies? Well, right. I mean, everybody today probably knows a little bit about post-colonial studies. It certainly transformed the university uh, along the lines that I've just suggested by uh, counseling people, urging people, forcing uh, reluctant departments to uh, study the imperial uh, uh, wars of the past and the uh, impact of the US and European empires abroad, uh, to think about those imperial experiences critically, to think about the work that was produced outside of Europe in other parts of the world. Th this is all the brief, as it were, of post-colonial studies. And it is his book, Orientalism, published in 1978, which really launched that field. As time grew on, he probably developed many reservations about some of the uh, avenues followed by post-colonial post studies. He was quite critical of it. Uh, it was more interested in questions of individual ethnic identity, and he was much more interested in questions of political liberation and the establishment of new states. So. There were significant differences as well, but he is the, the person who really founded the field, yes. The book that you mentioned, Orientalism, that would sort of launch post-colonial studies, would it be fair to say this is a, a book that is kind of rooted in literary criticism? Well, very much so. It is a, a book that really is analyzing philologists, right, which literally means the lovers of words, but really had to do with a, a rather ponderous and, and, and specialized technical uh, training in ancient languages. 
uh, that was very, very prominent in the 19th century. And basically what he's doing in Orientalism is trying to say that for all their obscurity, these, these wonderful polymaths who studied the literary classics of the Arab and Muslim worlds uh, created this grand drama of the human spirit. They were largely in love with, actually uncritically in love with the Arab and Islamic world. But what they were doing at the same time as they built this edifice of knowledge uh, in the West about the Oriental is imprisoning the people of the Middle East in the classics of their own past so that the relationship that Europeans developed to them was entirely stagnant. They were entirely thought of in terms of certain uh, images or caricatures taken from their own writings. What was not allowed was for the Oriental to tell his or her own story and to come off to us as the people, uh, very modern people with the same kinds of interests and concerns and problems that we have. So partly the book Orientalism was about this fantasy projection uh, in the West of the Oriental that was called upon by uh, some of the policymakers of the British Empire and, and used to uh, other uh, the, the Arab and uh, the Muslim. Um, but the other side of it is that Said was very, very admiring of the ability of these, these humanist literary intellectuals to produce this edifice. And so he's trying to study them. He's trying to ask how they did it. And he wants to learn their rhythms, images, and motifs, and their creating works that acquired mass density and referential power. And he, and, and he wants to put that to a different use. He wants to learn from them. How was Orientalism received when it came out in 1978? Well, I mean, it was an explosion. It was, um, I think I have a line in the book that many people from the Middle East, even though the problem of Orientalism as a fantasy projection by the West uh, had been written about by others before, but the particular panache and range and erudition of uh, Said's uh, work made it come alive in a completely different way. But in, in my book, I think I reference um, uh, an historian from the Middle East named Tarif Khalidi, who says, you know, when Orientalism came out, it was like, here we found one of our own finally telling the empire to go fuck itself, right? And so that, that's, that's how it came across to a lot of people. It was angry. And there was a place for anger in scholarship. That was one of the things that was implicit about his book. So it really uh, opened up a floodgate and uh, a lot of similar studies of its type written in other parts of the world or for or on behalf of other parts of the world, Latin America or Africa, uh, were the result of it. So that's one thing. On the other hand, I mean, Orientalists as a body of scholars are quite influential and they're well placed and they're places like Oxford and Princeton and Harvard and so on. Um, they retaliated. They were quite appalled uh, and they widely misunderstood, I think, what Edward was trying to do in the book. This was not a comprehensive history of all of Orientalism. It was rather a case study of certain Orientalist thinkers in the 19th and 20th century Britain and France and how the work they did was part and parcel, went hand in glove with the imperialist projects of those two nations during the same period. So, you know, it's really, from his point of view, he's a literary critic, right? So he's interested in questions of the power of words and the power of ideas to create realities. So instead of, you know, a materialistic study that shows that everything that happens in an era has to do with its economic relations of production, he's saying, well, wait a minute. I mean, a lot of what happens politically happens because somebody tells a better story than somebody else. This, in literary terms, would be called the power of representation. So he's trying to say, you know, when you represent something in words, when you tell a story about something, it isn't just reflecting that reality. It's a part of reality. It becomes a part of reality. And that's really the story he's trying to tell. And I think that the Orientalists, the specialists, you know, these area studies experts uh, who hated the book and, and felt it was a direct affront to them, they really didn't understand that aspect of it. I think they, they were really um, fighting against a straw man. Edward Said was born in Jerusalem in 1935 uh, as a child, basically grew up in Cairo, spent most of his life, that all said, in, in New York City. 
in some ways, I, I got the sense from your book that we could see Edward Said as, and this might be a little surprising to people listening, as a quintessential American. And I guess I would say that as a, a quintessential New Yorker American. I think that's entirely fair. Uh, to say for for many reasons. I mean, one of them before he come to live in the United States, he was already an American. Uh, he and his sisters uh, were American citizens at birth by virtue of their father having acquired American citizenship when he came to the United States during the era of World War One in order to escape the Turkish draft because Turkey at the time had the Ottoman Empire was in existence and controlled the entire Middle East. So he was subject to that rule. So this made him a little bit of a, an outsider within uh, Egypt, not only because of his American citizenship, which was quite unusual, but also because you know, he was of the Anglican faith, which is a tiny Christian minority, and because he was uh, from what the people in Egypt at the time would have thought of as greater Syria, right? So he was called a Shami. So, so in all these multiple ways, he was an outsider within Egypt. When he comes to the United States, of course, he's an outsider as well, even though he has American citizenship, his entire training has been in British imperial institutions in Cairo. And although he had visited New York several times before he came to live in the United States, he's sent over basically for high school uh, and, 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 and has gone to a, and, and has put in a uh, boarding school in Massachusetts that is, uh, uh, you know, kind of the work of founded by a fundamentalist Christian preacher named Dwight Moody. So this is his experience when he's there, but he he's always in every single moment of his life when he's come over before this time. And then afterwards, he's always passing through New York. You know, they would go by ship back then and they would dock in New York and they'd always spend a couple of weeks in New York. And he he felt like he was a New Yorker before he ever came to the United States, I would argue. And he certainly did that when he was going to school in Massachusetts. He'd take whatever opportunity he could, any excuse, and go down to New York and get a room in an apartment and spend his time watching movies on 42nd Street. So, A lover of uh, film. Yeah, a great lover of, of, of Hollywood film, uh, particularly when he's on his own in the United States because his life was rather regimented uh, back in... Uh, Cairo, particularly when it came to uh, a sexually suggestive uh, Hollywood fair. And so when he's finally let loose on his own, he he watches things uh, over and over again at, at, at Times Square theaters. So yeah, he's he's an American, but I think it's important to say in this same light that this does not in any way make him unauthentic or inauthentic as a Palestinian. Uh, this is what it means to be a Palestinian, basically, is to be in exile. I mean, to be an authentic Palestinian is to not live in Palestine, actually. You know, it's to live in uh, uh, Lebanon or to, to be a guest worker in Saudi Arabia or, or to live in Detroit or Los Angeles. Uh, that's the Palestinian experience writ large. And it is in the particular valence of Edward, uh, his own as well. Certainly want to dive into his connection to Palestine. Briefly, though, before, how important was his time in Cairo? This is the early 1950s and, and before. This is a time of a nationalist movement still during British colonialism. W would this be important in understanding Edward Said and, and his ideas later on? Well, I mean, the big, the big uh, explosions in Cairo that took place to produce the, you know, Nasserite uh, rejection of the British occupation took place after he was gone. And it's important that, you know, Edward born in 1935, I think he's over in the United States already in the early 1950s. So it's really kind of the, the late 30s and 40s that characterized uh, his time in Cairo. Um, Cairo is really important for him in all kinds of ways. I think probably the most important, though, is that he had his first truly intellectual encounter uh, during those years with his music teacher, who is a, a Polish a Jewish emigre to Cairo named Ignaz Tigerman, who was very, very well known as one of the great performers of Chopin and Brahms. He's kind of legendary in certain circles for that, but he was also a terrific teacher. And it was not 
given that you could just simply, if you wanted to pay, you know, the, the pound uh, per lesson that it costs to go teach with him, you couldn't necessarily get taken in. You had to be good enough. But he really developed a close relationship with Tigaman. And, you know, it's important to know that apart from his religious training, so he's reading the Book of Common Prayer, apart from that kind of reading, the first reading, real reading that he does in Cairo is uh, that of musical encyclopedias and uh, books of opera and that kind of thing. This is really where, where his first love uh, is when it comes to intellectual and aesthetic matters, not, not literature or philosophy, which would later become important, of course. But, and and this, this intense relationship that he had with his teacher, Tigaman, you know, existed throughout his life. He, he went back to Cairo later in his life simply to meet Tigaman again. He would visit Tigaman uh, in Kitzbühel, uh, Austria, where Tigaman had a, a summer home. So it's um, very formative for him in this way. Right. I mean, the, of course, he's a child of privilege. He's living in a, a household of a, a wealthy businessman who owned the British concession uh, of uh, office equipment. So he, he had had money and he lived in a wonderful kind of country club like atmosphere on an island in the middle of, you know, the Nile uh, in central Cairo uh, called Zamalek. So there was that kind of thing. But that isn't so important for his later formation because he was really cocooned there. He was cut off from the, the life of Cairo around him. So I think it's really, in terms of the Edward that we later came to know, it's this relationship to music. Yeah, and he was a fine pianist. I mean, he may very well have been able to make a career at that if he, if he chose to do so. That would remain to be seen. He chose not to do it. He was extremely good. Um, and I've heard some of his recordings from the 1950s when he was a student at Princeton, and they're quite amazing. Uh, when he was practicing a lot, which was in those years, I'd say from the time he's in high school through his time at Princeton, and he's studying music at Princeton, he's studying music theory, he's studying composition, he is contemplating that as a career. But there are people that I talked to in the course of writing the biography who were uh, his uh, classmates at the time, and close friends of his, roommates even, who went on to make careers in music, who said that Edward, as great as he was, pushed the tempo. He, he didn't like to perform. It was, you know, it was too tense for him. He did perform and he performed really well, but um, it might have gotten in the way of a career uh, in music. Anyway, how were you able, how were you able to, to hear his recordings from? from back in the day? Well, I was fortunate enough to have the confidence of Edward's family and a lot of his childhood friends that have not given interviews to other people because there have been clumsy efforts to defame Edward uh, in the past. Uh, so people were very suspicious about who to talk to. So I had their um, confidence, and I think that word spread so that it's okay to talk to him, you know, that kind of thing. So some of these were in the family's possession. And... Uh, I had access to them that way. Yeah. You also went through his FBI file. I did. Now, the FBI file is not difficult to get, but it is frustrating because, of course, like all FBI files, it's heavily redacted. But uh, there are about um, 47 pages or so that are not redacted or not heavily redacted that really give a, a series of very interesting bits of information about him, uh, you know, what what they thought about Edward. Um, you know, first, it, of course, they were worried about his affiliation with, quote, terrorists, unquote. Um, very soon they realized that that was not going on and that was absurd. But they did, in fact, closely read. They had a body of people who went and worked through all of his essays uh, for the uh, AAUG, which is the student group that he was in, involved in. It's more than a student group. It's a group of Arab uh, university graduates. It's a professional organization of Arabs that he often delivered talks at and that really catches the attention of the FBI to begin with. But all the essays that he wrote for the New York Times, the articles, are gone over meticulously by these FBI agents who are writing summaries of it. And you know, some of their reports are really admiring they, they really love him. They think he's, he's, he's really smart. He writes well. You know, he's a great speaker. It's, it's kind of funny to read them. Were, were they following him mostly because of his connection to Palestine and, and perhaps specifically the PLO? 
Yeah, of course, they're, they're, the, well, keep in mind, like, it depends on what years we're talking about. The PLO, even though it seems like it's been in existence forever, was, was really kind of a late formation, I would say, and I might be wrong about this exact date, but about 1968 or so is when the various factions of the Palestinian liberation movement, which were very divided, are um, kind of unified under the umbrella, umbrella of the PLO. So it, it could be that uh, Edward, maybe a year or so before that, who he's joined these organizations and there's, there's no PLO really to, to talk about. Um, but yeah, the, the, the idea would be that they're, they're, they're worried about two things. You know, number one, they're worried about is actual involvements with people who are plotting you know, the overthrow of, of the Israeli government, I suppose. Um, and of course, there, there's nothing there uh, of that sort to be found. But the other thing, and they're very frank about it in, in, in the FBI files, they're worried about the articulate and well-defended case that somebody who is an eloquent intellectual can make that might disrupt American foreign policy. And indeed, that fear was well-founded because he did, in fact, disrupt and really change the conversation over the Israel-Palestine uh, uh, situation. What, what can you tell me about Edward Said's relationship to the PLO and and perhaps specifically to Yasser Arafat? Well, he he was, although not originally, very, very close friends with Yasser Arafat. And he paints a, a marvelous portrait of him in a number of different uh, early essays to make the case that Arafat in, in person was very, very different from the way he came across uh, in the public, not not surprisingly, that, that He's a kind of a, a tender and a modest sort of man who listened intently to whatever anybody said. He always had a pencil and pad of paper with him to write down what you were going to say. Um, Edward admired his enormous courage to put himself in the, you know, the, the sights, as it were, of the uh, wrath of the uh, Israeli army. Um, the fact that for well or ill, he had managed to unify the Palestinian movement. All of these things were things he, he liked very much about him. But Edward goes over in 1972, having just married a woman uh, from Lebanon, uh, Mariam Cortas, uh, the daughter of a very well-known family, a business family in uh, Lebanon. And he settles in to Beirut. And, 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 and Beirut becomes, in 1972, his second home, his, his kind of intellectual contact, immediate contact with the intellectual and political world of the Middle East. Uh, that's the role that Beirut has in fact traditionally played. So he, he's there, but he doesn't know anything about the PLO at that time or Arafat. He's not met him. He's just there writing a book, his first really important academic book, and getting to know people. And he, of course, establishes all kinds of political connections with radicals of various types, including this Syrian Marxist named Sadiq al -Azim. But it's on the basis of that time there that he is called upon in New York when just a few years later, Arafat comes to deliver that famous UN speech in which you know he says, don't let the olive branch fall from my hand, that, that wonderful speech. Edward had a role in translating that and in uh, maybe adding certain details to that. He's called upon there and that's how he gets to know the leadership of the PLO and Arafat personally. So in his constant back and forth between New York and Lebanon in the years after that, throughout the 70s and into the 80s, he is uh, getting to know all of the PLO leadership very, very well. So um, Shafi al-Hut, for example, one of, uh, of the right-hand men of Arafat is one of his closest friends and remains his closest friend throughout life. So that's, as everyone knows, that as time wore on, he became more and more critical of the Palestinian leadership and Arafat personally, that they were top heavy, that they were not listening to the people who they probably could have benefited from the advice of, and that they were always seeking back channels to power, you know, instead of like affecting public opinion, they thought they could cut a deal behind the scenes. And so uh, Edward and Noam Chomsky and others are constantly trying to uh, petition the PLO leadership to not do this, and they continually do it. And then, of course, the big explosion takes place during the Oslo Accords in um, 1993, and that's where the break uh, that is never 
affixed takes place. This humanizing of Arafat early on seems significant to me, and you will correct me if my perception of this is wrong, but I suspect this is during a time when Arafat, at the time, is seen in the West as sort of the number one terrorist in the world. Yeah, I mean, the caricatures of Arafat in the press were um, absolutely unbelievable. Um, so the distortions were were there for all to see. So Edward's very creative in the way that he tried to humanize the Palestinian leadership and Arafat personally. He has this marvelous idea at one point. I think this is in the 1980s, actually. But he, he, he is able to place a piece with Interview Magazine, which at the time was an Andy Warhol uh, based publication, you know, the kind of the, the last word in, in, in postmodern hip dumb, you know, and he, and he publishes this, this piece in there called Breakfast with Arafat, in which it's, you know, it's largely a, a conversation between him and Arafat. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a, a marvelously effective moment that uh, makes so many of the caricatures in the mainstream press fall away. Did, did this create enemies? American enemies here, Israeli enemies, I guess, for, for Edward Said? Naturally, yes. I, I think probably the book that he wrote that made the most enemies was the book he published immediately after Orientalism called The Question of Palestine, which is, um, is a very interesting publishing history. It was uh, petitioned, or not petitioned, it was uh, commissioned and was rejected by its first publisher, uh, Beacon Books in uh, Boston, uh, on political grounds. They didn't like what he had done. So this book, for those who don't know it, is, is a remarkably patient, fact-filled, primer-like book that just simply lays out the facts on the ground about how Israel was formed and what Zionism is as opposed to the Israeli state uh, or the possibilities of, of, of an Israeli state, you know, what that not always comfortable relationship between Zionism and the Israeli state is, um, and who the Palestinians are and where they came from, you know, the demographics. It's, it's, it's a remarkable book um, for being so informative and so apparently um, calm. Uh, it, 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 and I think that because it's that book, it, it speaks with a kind of authority, right? It's absolutely pellucid. It's crystal clear what he's saying. The case he's presenting is absolutely undeniable, and yet it is calling the legitimacy of Zionism into question very, very clearly, with a number of uh, you know weapons at its disposal. Part of them alluding to the crimes that were committed in the creation of Israel in 1948. So nobody had ever read anything like it. Nobody could have written it, but Edward. So that book really, really got people. And it made his name mud in some of the New York media world. Of course, the other side of it is that he's now the go-to person on questions in the Middle East, which made him the darling of another part of the New York media world. But I, I get into that in, in, in certain parts of the book about his struggle after the publication of 1979 to make his impact uh, continue to be felt in the New York media, because he'd always been very good at placing things in the New York Times, New York Review of Books, Harper's, and so on. Very interesting story, what happens. Tell me more about that then. I mean, because he also would write and was closely connected to The Nation magazine. I guess that's one place he, he could get his things published. Right. He had um, you know independently established a reputation with The Nation very early in his career. Keep in mind, he, he, he you know, he's a New Yorker, right? He loved New York. He studied... Uh, undergrad at Princeton, then he went to Harvard, studied there, and then his first job is at Columbia University. Ideal job for him, New York City. Never really leaves. Um, he goes to New York and immediately becomes a New York intellectual with everything that that entails. You know, the New York intellectuals is usually a, a term that's applied to a group of, uh, of, 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 of Jewish thinkers on the left who were public intellectuals, right? Uh, Irving Howe and, you know, uh, others uh, around the Partisan Review. Uh, yet he is telling the same kinds of stories about exile um, that they told, but from an Arab point of view, a Palestinian point of view. Um, and he's writing for 
the New York media world. And he's successful right from the very beginning. He has all kinds of uh, friends and associates at Columbia University who are opening these doors for him. But he's also, you know, clever enough to know how to use those entrees. And so he's publishing things on literary theory, even, in the New York Times, and, and writing for crossover journals like Partisan Review. So his ability to get into things like The Nation magazine was, was long established before he wrote Orientalism and the Question of Palestine. It's just that after he became this celebrity to be both revered and feared, you know, uh, depending on your position on Israel, uh, there's a there's a big, for example, there's a big article in, um, I think, Time magazine that calls him the, the rising star of uh, English studies and the PLO, right, which is kind of, you know, hammering away at him at the same time that it's praising him. It's, it's largely respectful, but it's also sort of underhanded. That's the kind of person he becomes. And so he's got to find a way to continue to get placed. And he finds it in Harper's magazine. He finds it in The Nation magazine. Um, and he finds it in, in London, in the London Review, Review of Books, whose attitude towards Israel really entirely changes. The editorial outlook of the London Review of Books, by its own admission, changed because of Edward Said and became more pro-Palestinian. I mean, Edward Said is important to understand in people's perception of what's happening in Israel and, and Palestine and, and the evolution and the change that would occur. Exactly. Yeah. Um, talk to me about another uh, Edward Said's relationship to another nation journalist at the time, Christopher Hitchens. Many of us remember Christopher Hitchens as somebody who you know was with the nation for many years, considered somebody on on the left, um, but then would support the Iraq invasion uh, in two thousand and three. Uh, t- tell me about Christopher Hitchens and Edward Said. Well, Christopher Hitchens um, was, uh, I think it's fair to say, a very close friend of Edwards and was somebody who was very courageous in participating with Edward, not only at public forums uh, in, in which, uh, you know, Zionism and the Zionist project was called into question and, you know, the Palestinian case was, was put, put forward positively. But he also collaborated with Edward on a, uh, a kind of, uh, again, a primer-like uh, informational book called Blaming the Victims, which was uh, in, an important carrying on of what he had begun, of what Edward had begun in The Question of Palestine. So Hitchin was, was there and on call and to be trusted when it came to the, the issue around Palestine and Israel. What's more, because he was in New York uh, writing for the nation, actually, I think he was based in Washington, D.C., but he was frequently in New York and uh, was at the time friends with the great left Irish journalist Alexander Coburn, that he and the, you know, the editor of, uh, of a, a wonderful literary magazine uh, named Ben Sonnenberg became a kind of, you know, group of buddies and they would hang out all together. They became a kind of, you know, crew, as it were, right? And they, they mutually uh, defended one another and supported one another and wrote for each other's publications and, and, and at, were at public events together and so on. It was a wonderful marriage of minds. The thing is that I think there were a lot of people who could see the, um, how could I put it, the, the incipient move that, uh, that, Hitchens would eventually make towards, uh, how to call it, the God that failed school, right? The kind of uh, thing that we associate with people like Arthur Kessler or with uh, George Orwell, right? The, the, the leftists who, with the show of being more honest and uh, more self-critical, uh, is really sort of flirting with positions that are traditionally associated with the right. And, and I think that they were coming to Edward and saying, I don't think you should trust this guy. I mean, it isn't only his politics that are that are dodgy. It's it's also that he is, he's not faithful. He's not loyal. He's he's going to betray you. And Edward would always um, just hear nothing of it, and he didn't want to hear it. I, I I can say this because I know I know of other people having said this to him, but I said it to him myself. Um, and so hmm. I think mm-hmm. that when Hitchens finally makes the move. And he leaves the Nation magazine after having been caught feeding compromising information about Bill Clinton while president. Dickens star. Uh, 
to Kenneth Starr. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's one thing to be critical of Clinton, but it's another thing to be feeding it to Kenneth Starr. I mean, really. So he's caught out and he decides just to uh, let the, you know, shoe fit, as it were, and uh, to defect to the right wing. Because after all, there's better venues and there's greater pay and there's a larger circle of, of people. It was an opportunist move, I think. Um, but I can't be entirely uh, clear that uh, there wasn't also a great deal of conviction on the part of his uh, on the part of Hitchens. But, you know, Hitchens then writes, as Edward is on his deathbed, um, a scurrilous piece on the book Orientalism for the Atlantic uh, Monthly. And um, Edward asked a number of people, he asked me, but he had probably asked others as well to write a response uh, to this, which I which I did. But, um, you know, it's not until it's not until this kind of open betrayal that he he finally realizes that Hitchens perhaps is not the person he thought he was. And and he he comes to this on, on he dies of leukemia in two thousand and three. Edward Said does he, he right. comes to this realization on uh, then or or beforehand? Did did they have a falling out? They had no direct falling out, as I said, because of the uh, the the. Uh, reasons that Edward, who was always fiercely loyal, gave to those who came to him, that he's not going to listen to tales told out of school. He has to see it with his own eyes. He probably got an inkling of it, though, that, you know, uh, Ben Ben Sonnenberg was uh, a really important editor, right, um, of a journal slash magazine called Grand Street, which really housed some of the best and biggest names in the world of letters. You know, the, the greatest novelists of the day were publishing there. Everybody who was anybody published there. Edward Edward published seven different essays for them. So as long as Sonnenberg offered this kind of opportunity to um, Hitchens, Hitchens was his friend. But the minute that uh, Sonnenberg had to res retire because he had multiple sclerosis, um, Hitchens just dropped him dead, dropped him flat. And I think that a lot of people pointed out the tastelessness of that move uh, to Edward, and Edward still would not um, would not say that there was anything wrong. It had to do with this open attack on him in the Atlantic Monthly, which wasn't just an attack; it was also extremely pretentious. Um, Hitchens pretended that he knew German and like he had this huge body of knowledge, and it was all just bluff. It was a, a, a classic case of. Uh, of, of, of treachery. How was Edward Said received in the Arab world? And you mentioned and referenced a little while ago Sadiq al Azam, and and that was a friend of Edward Said. But they had a pretty vigorous debate when it came to Orientalism. I mean, I think it, it is fair to say that they were friends. It probably it's not going. Uh, far enough. It's it's not strong enough to say they were friends. They were absolutely inseparable. They were cronies. And I would say that they, in, in these formative years of the early 1970s, were leaning on one another, and even in a way in competition with one another about who could be the, the biggest bad boy, you know, in, in Arab letters, right? Because Sadiq al-Azam is a remarkable intellectual. He's a very interesting man. I, I had the good fortune of being able to interview him before he died. Um, as part of this project. And he had written, you know, a critique of religious thought, if you can imagine that, in the Middle East in the late 60s, which became a success to scandal. It was really a big thing. It got denounced and, and uh, it was also, I think, pulled from uh, bookstores and, and so on widely across the Middle East, which made him infamous in precisely the way that he would want to be. And it's it's in this period uh, that they that is Edward and Sadiq were really really close. He'd have Sadiq over to the United States for a while. Sadiq taught in the United States. They would hold political events together. They were uh, people who would share their writing with one another before they published it. Very very close. But when Orientalism was published, Sadiq turned on him and said, "This is not at all where we should be going." What you're doing is you're hurting the Marxist cause in the Middle East in a number of ways. Number one, we're eager 
in the Middle East to get people to think in terms of modernity, right? The Enlightenment. We want people to turn their attention to the sciences and the technical uh, uh, disciplines. We want to create a history of the Middle East that is materialist in nature. And what is Orientalism offering? Orientalism is all about culture, right? And it's, it's also trying to uh, make the West, you know, an eternal West appear to be a villain, you know, like Shaitan, Satan. I mean, it's a gift to the mullahs is, is what uh, really he was arguing. And he wasn't alone. So um, Sadiq writes this 40 page review of Orientalism in which he expounds upon these things and tries to publish it in the journal that Edward co-edited with uh, Ibrahim Abdulkhod and another. And um, Edward was willing to publish it in full and just provide a response. But his other editors said no, they wanted it severely cut. Sadiq said no. Anyway, it went back and forth this way and it really was a break in their relationship. There are a couple letters between them that are quite feisty um, and accusatory. Probably it could have been overcome, this rift, but when Sadiq a little bit later uh, began to spread the word that Edward was complicit with U.S. intelligence, that was the last straw. And although they had mutual friends that tried to bring them back together again, they were never friends again. Was there any truth to that? No, there's no truth to that. I mean, the thing that the PLO leadership, when they were angry at Edwards' limelight and and their, and, and also angry at the criticisms that he mounted of their leadership, when they wanted to blacken his name, they would say, "Well, look, he's he's a collaborator, right? He he's a he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations." And Edward said, "I've never tried to hide that I am. Why should I give up this this uh, forum? This is a way that I can talk to people." It's just like Chatham House in Britain. You know, it's a, it's a place where people of, of, of a certain uh, kind of stature and with a certain kind of knowledge and with certain connections can come and try to influence policymakers. He said the PLO itself was trying to get invited to the Council on Foreign Relations. They would have loved to have been. So, no, there's no, there's no truth to anything like that in Edward. This is interesting about Edward Said a real serious critic of Western intellectualism, yet very much connected to its institutions and its academic institutions. Well, I wouldn't say that Edward was a critique of, uh, was a critic of Western intellectualism. I think that he was a, a, a critic of the complicity of certain uh, disciplinary formations within the university and uh, state, state power in its imperial form. That would be more like it. I think that he was also critical of certain uh, trends and tendencies within the university. In the early 1980s, he writes what by, in my opinion, and not only mine, is his best book, which is a book of essays called The World, the Text, and the Critic, which basically tries to take the kind of uh, criticism that he mounted in Orientalism and to apply it to the American university, to say that humanists in the university are caught up in a kind of neo-religious, you know, deification of, of, of language and the word, and that they are so embroiled in these uh, arid debates uh, over linguistics and representation that they've stopped relating to the outside world. And what's, what's worse is that they're doing all of this you know, this hypertrophic uh, writing of literary theory essays for obscure journals, they're doing it with the aura of being involved in important political events. And they're doing this, moreover, in the age of Reaganism. So, you know, it's not like they're directly complicit with Reagan, but they are, in fact, contributing to the culture of Reaganism by, by, by taking, you know, the, the, the university and its intellectuals out of the game of politics. So I think that's the nature of his critique. Uh, he's not against intellectualism, far from it. He's for the intellectual, as long as we understand by the intellectual, a non-dogmatic, unaffiliated generalist who is not afraid 
to step outside his or her discipline to talk about the major events of the of the time. Was his battle with leukemia a long one? Would it affect or even influence his thoughts before his before he died? I think there's no question that it did in a number of concrete ways. It was a long one. The kind of uh, leukemia he had at the time, it's important to say that because now if he had were to have the same diagnosis today, he, he probably would have lived for a very, very long time. It, it's, it can be treated now. It wasn't so much at the time. And there were complications that were peculiar to him that people who get his type of leukemia normally don't, don't get. So there were a couple of things working against him. But that being said, what, from 1991 until 2003, he beat the odds. Usually somebody with his kind of uh, his illness at the time dies within seven years, and he, he beat that. He beat that out of sheer orneriness, I think, uh, and uh, willpower. Uh, but uh, he, did, he did, in fact, stay around longer. So it was a long one. How did it affect his work? In a number of ways. He um, had tried to write a novel earlier in his life and had abandoned it. Uh, when he got his diagnosis, he was at work on a, a novel, a second novel, a different novel. And uh, he puts it to the side after his diagnosis and decides that he's going to write a memoir instead. And he gets out that memoir. It became a prize-winning uh, memoir, as uh, many know, called Out of Place, which he finished in 1999. So one of the things is for him to turn away from simply writing about political events and literary questions and to turn to autobiographical ones. And that is a direct result of his getting this diagnosis. Number two, he decides to perform piano in public, uh, which he hadn't dared to do for a long time, but he in fact manages to do in 1993 at both Columbia and at Georgetown, uh, performing with a friend of his from the old days in Lebanon, Diana Takedin, who is a professional pianist. So these would be two ways in which I think he was affected. And I think the third thing that, that really is to, you know, at the basis of uh, the results of the diagnosis is that he decides to write more frequently uh, for Arab audiences directly. And so he writes both in English language and in Arabic language newspapers at a remarkable clip. I mean, like one essay per week, you know, for each one of these things for about three or four years. It produced a massive volume of work and, and, and really some of the best work. The, the articles written in Arabic? Well, in yeah. well, well here's the thing. He, he did, in fact, write uh, some of the articles at the beginning of this process in Arabic directly. He certainly was capable of doing so. I have direct testimony from his, um, from his uh, assistant at the time, who's a native Arabic speaker and also from his wife, that he's quite capable of writing in Arabic. But for some reason, the publications didn't want that. They wanted him to write to them in English and then have them translate it. Their translations were often inept, however, and so then those Arabic translations had to be put back to Said's office and gone over again to make sure that they made sense. So that's kind of the process about how it worked. But the the work that he did for these, these um, newspapers and magazines in the Arab world, or some of them are kind of Arab and Muslim publications that are based in London. So it's kind of a combination of things, but for an Arab audience, these things, they're, they're remarkably varied in the genres that he chooses. You know, it's everything from autobiography to political expose to political economic analysis to, you know, uh, book review. I mean, th there's this remarkable uh, fertility in what he's doing. And then there's the fact that he's explaining for the, th the 13th millionth time the same things, but never getting tired about it, always choosing a different way of putting it, never quoting himself from an earlier article. You know, it's quite astounding, actually. The sheer energy he had, given his passion for the Palestinian cause, allowed him to produce what, from my point of view, from a critical and, and literary point of view, some of the finest writing was of his life. And, and finally, in that last last decade of his life, as, as he is battling leukemia, were, were you close? Were you close to him? I was close to him. I mean, I hesitate to say it because he's close to thousands of people. He, he had friends everywhere. So, uh, 
I think you know the wonderful uh, Egyptian novelist Adaf Suif jokes about that sort of thing. I was you know one of his three thousand closest friends, and I would say that that's that's me. I I I. I I was close to him, right? I mean, I went to his house and had scotches with him. And when he was not able to teach his classes at Columbia, I was in New York at the time, and he would invite me to come teach his classes for him, you know, that kind of thing. So we, when when Hitchens betrayed him in the uh, in the article in the Atlantic, he called me up and said, "Would you would you respond?" You know, um, so so that kind of thing. But I don't want to oversell it. There's lots of people who's close to, him, and there's certainly people who's closer to than I. Do, yeah. do you feel like the the sickness gave him some a uh, perspective? Oh yeah. <laughs> I invited him to teach to to give lectures at the university I was then teaching at in New York right after his diagnosis. And you know, it's hard if you don't know anything about Edward the person, he was very vulnerable and very uh boyish, I would say, in, in many ways. At the same time that he could be imperious. It's a funny combination, but both of those things were in him. And so he couldn't stop talking about it, about the diagnosis. He just, he wore it on his sleeve. He, he was, it was on his mind all the time at that moment, right? And he, he was afraid. He was afraid about what he wouldn't be able to accomplish. He was afraid of having the disease, disease per se. What it was going to make him look like. I mean, what it was going to do to his his life. I mean, he, he was in, in his prime, um, and so I think that it definitely changed his perspective. It certainly changed his perspective on the Palestinian issue. I think that it inclined him more to let it all hang out and to stop uh, stop uh, trying to be politic when it comes to questions of principle and. Uh, it, it moved him more and more towards the writing on, on music, which had been, as I've already said to you, his first love. It's in his writing on music that, you know, because there's no professional pressures, it's not his field after all, he could be um, brutally honest in his judgments about other people's performances or their works. And he, he never allowed himself that kind of, you know, b brutal honesty as a critic as he does in his music criticism. It also allows him to indulge in the aesthetic, you know, which he always denied himself in, in literature, being much more interested in the political contents and historical record left behind in uh, literary works. And in music, it's all about the aesthetic. And so you see this in his later works, like the, the, the posthumous work on late style is really this perfect fusion of his literary and his musical sensibilities. And it's uh, about not giving up really, you know, as you grow old, you know, not being complacent, not settling in as the eminence grise, you know, that's what he is really talking about when he's talking about on late style. So it, it affected the content of what he wrote, it affected what he wrote about and how. Letting it all hang out on Palestine, would, would that be what we would kind of recognize today as, as, a, as a one state solution? You know, saying something to the effect of two people, one land? Yes, I think that that's part of what I mean. What I also mean is that after the Oslo Accords were were agreed to by the PLO in the most undemocratic way possible within the, the Palestinian organization, um, he just calls, you know, Arafat a booth lazy, right? Which is to say, the the head of a of a Bantustan, you know. So he he's comparing uh, Arafat to a collaborator with the South African apartheid government who settled for this tiny little island of land just to kind of preserve his own power. That's, that, those, are, those are fighting words. Those are words that burn bridges. And he had denied himself that beforehand. So that's what I mean by letting it all hang out in part. But you're quite right. The other side of it is this, that after the Oslo Accords are signed, he recognizes that the struggle for Palestinian, as an independent Palestinian state uh, is is not really possible any longer, right? That, in effect, the facts on the ground are that Palestine and Israel are unified territory, that the Israeli army and Israeli law governs the entire territory. And so the question shifts from the independent states with mutual security 
concerns taken into consideration to what kind of state is Israel-Palestine going to be? Is it continue to be an apartheid state or is it going to be a state founded on a democracy and equality before the law? He isn't the one who invented this one state solution. Um, it has been around since the birth of Israel in 1948, but he did revive it, he did a great deal to popularize it. And I would say that it's, it's now a, a rather popular option. It's not by any means the only one, but it's still a part of the conversation in part because of his uh, efforts. It cer certainly has grown over the years. Yeah. Yeah. Timothy Brennan has joined us for a conversation on his biography. It's called Places of Mind, A Life of Edward Said. He's also a professor of humanities at the University of Minnesota. Timothy Brennan, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you for taking the time to talk to us about your biography. Thank you. I enjoyed it, too. Thanks for having me.